So Abraham obeyed. Abraham is known as the great father of the faithful, the father of the faithful. I mean, look into his life. I was looking in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, and I noticed this saying, Abraham had accepted without question the promise of a son. But he did not wait for God to fulfill his word in his own time and way. And Hagar was the result. She goes on to write, God had called Abraham to be the father of the faithful. And his life was to be to stand as an example of faith for succeeding generations. But his faith had not been perfect. You open your Bibles to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, <clears throat> I want to look at a very familiar story, maybe to you, about in the life of Abraham. Many years had passed, as they're going on, and the promise had given of a child, and Isaac had been born, growing up as a boy. Filling that home must have been with joy to have the son of promise there. Genesis 22, would you pick up with first, first verse of Genesis 22, verse 1. Sometime later, that was quite a bit, a few years, more than a few years, God tested Abraham and he said, Abraham, here I am, replied Abraham. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Was Isaac Abraham's only son? No, there was Ishmael. Ishmael was also his son. But God specifically identified this son as your only son, the son of promise, the son that I had given you. So, so take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go into the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there on a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. And as you read that story, I go, wait, 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 wait. That does not make sense. The one of promise, the person of promise that was given. And now God is saying, wait, 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 wait. I'm yelling at him going, no, of course not. It is interesting that um, in Canaan, they were doing child sacrifices at this time. And so... The nations around were doing those sort of things. And God stood in contrast to that of not doing human sacrifices, but doing animal sacrifices. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, God says, take your son. Take him. What about the great commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. That was there, was it not? Is that not? Abraham... Of course, the Ten Commandments hadn't been given, but the principle of thou shalt not kill was already there in Scripture. And so, Abraham, wake up here. Go. But Abraham obeyed, the Bible said. Abraham obeyed. And so, verse 3, early in the next morning, next morning he got up. And he uh, got up and he loaded his donkey and he took with him two servants and his son Isaac. And when they had cut enough wood uh, for a burnt offering, he set out for a place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, now stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And then Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God himself would provide. In Abraham's mind, Isaac had been provided by God. Isn't that not true? 
He had been a miracle baby. Sarah was way too old to have children, and yet she gave birth to Isaac. So, the Lord had provided in Abraham's mind. I'd like you to just stick your finger right there. We'll come back to that. John 1. John 1, the story is in John 1 of John the uh, Baptist. John the Baptist is out preaching on the river and baptized Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We don't know if John really understood that the Lord himself was going to be the sacrifice. We don't understand, we don't know if he understood truly what he was saying. But that proclamation that he made there, that day that behold, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world, was incredibly, incredibly insightful for us. You see, God himself will provide the offering. God himself will provide the offering. And the Lord provided his son to die on Calvary for our sin. The burnt offering was to be offered for sin. And so God provided his own son. The Bible says, And the uh, two, Abraham and Isaac, went on together. And they came to the spot up on top of Mount Moriah, and there they pulled together those stones. And they laid out the wood on the altar, as they had done many times before. Made the altar ready. And then... Abraham had to have this discussion with Isaac about what the Lord had told him and what the Lord had commanded. What a tough moment that would be. And Isaac could have run. He could have said, see you later, I'm gone. But he laid down on the altar, bound and then Abraham, he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him and said from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied, here I am. I believe that was the Lord, that that was Jesus who called out to him. Here I am, Abraham answered. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son, Isaac, from me. You have not withheld. Where that took place was on Mount Moriah, that offering. They found in the thicket that was caught. The Lord provided a ram in the thicket. And they took the ram and they offered the ram as the sacrifice that day. That offering was made on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is significant because at Mount Moriah is where the temple would sit. It's where the altar would be set on the same exact place where Isaac was offered. Islam says it was Ishmael that was offered. But the Bible teaches clearly that it was Isaac that was offered. There on the mountain, in Jerusalem now, the Dome of the Rock, and you can see the picture there of the Dome of the Rock, rests right over the rock, the rock in Jerusalem. So Abraham called that place, the Lord provided, will provide, and to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Well, as I read that story, and I mean, over this week, I've been thinking about this, the question that came into my mind that comes up to me is, well, would I obey God as Abraham did? As a parent, that's not an easy answer to, to come up with. Would I go do that? Would I offer that? And it made me pause and think. I have children that I'd give my soul and heart for. I'd lay down my life for my children. But would I obey God in that fashion? Big Lake Youth Camp is a great camp up in uh, Oregon. The Oregon Conference has one, and it's literally on a lake called Big Lake. 
And um, they have all kinds of camping activities there at the uh, camp all summer long for um, youth and children, so forth, going on all the time. And um, they actually teach you to walk on water there uh, because the water comes off the snow and uh, you would never want to fall in it when you're water skiing. Actually, as the summer was on, you can get in it. <laughs> so cold. But my sons went up there, and they, they were there during the summer. And, and uh, on Sabbath afternoon, on Sabbath afternoon, they, they would have what they call a walk through the Bible. So they take the children and they take them to many different scenes that they have and they show them the Bible story. Sometimes it's an emphasis on the Old Testament, sometimes on the New. Uh, but usually it focuses on Christ and Jesus' life. And so they, were, they would go around and I was there that Sabbath and I was walking around and following the children as they'd go and learn the story of the birth and then the life of Jesus and some of the miracles and we were wandering all around the camp from scene to scene. It was quite, a, quite an enjoyable thing to do. Well, as I came and was walking down the path, and I knew what was coming up was the, uh, the crucifixion of Christ. And I know they had been working on it, and it made it as look absolutely as real as possible. But as I came around the bend and looked back up at, at the crosses, there was my son Scott on the cross. And I was stunned as I looked up and saw my son. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Because I immediately remembered Abraham offered his son. And there's my son up there, my flesh and blood, up on the cross. And I thought, of, I thought of the father offering Jesus, his son, up on the cross. You couldn't look at it and you couldn't look away, you know what I mean? I'll never forget that feeling. And tears came to my eyes. It, it was a play. It was just a representation. He wasn't hurt. In a few minutes, he'd be let off and he'd get jumped down and go off to dinner or whatever he was going to do. But to see him up there, spread out on the cross... And I thought the great love God had for his son and his love for me as I was looking at that cross. Those of you who are parents, maybe you can identify with that. I'll never forget it. I'll never lose that image of my son on the cross. And as Jesus offered his son, Jesus offered as the son on that cross. It was amazing to me. It changed me inside about the value that God had placed on me and on you. So when I say I, I don't know if I would obey God, if he'd asked me to offer my son. Hebrews 11. It's interesting in Hebrews 11 that um, Paul picks up this theme. It's talked about in there, the great Hebrews 11 is the uh, chapter of faith, the great chapter of faith. And so in this, he, he talks about this, and I, I wanted you to notice that. Hebrews Chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice the one and only son. Even though God had said to him, 
It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham passed, you see? Abraham passed, passed his test. So as I was thinking about this, I, I was thinking, well, what, what should we learn from this today? What would we learn that would be something that we could take home and something to say, yes, I heard the story, I knew it, but today I walked out with this. What could I, what could I take home for this today? And so I was thinking about this, struggling with this. I could say, well, one of the things I could say is do what God tells you to do, right? Do what God tells you to do. That would be, that would be simple. That would be great. However, there have been long years of silence when God did not say anything to Abraham. And no record that he was communicating with him. Just on certain occasions that are recorded, do we see God speaking to him? And I thought about that. Perhaps some of us don't feel God communicates to us. I thought, well, maybe I could say something like, well, trust God like Abraham. That would be, thing, you know, Abraham, the father of the faithful. So trust, trust God like Abraham. That would be the thing to do. But then if you remember in our start this morning, God called Abraham to be the father of the faithful and his wife to stand as an example of faith to succeeding generations, but his faith was not perfect. His faith had not been perfect. When I was growing up, I used to think we had super saints in the church. I used to look at the mature women, looking around at the mature women, and I'd say, oh, yes, they, they certainly are going, who would never have reached such purity that they would never, ever commit something wrong. Why, those women were so godly and so forth, the women, the church. And I, particularly, I was looking at the elderly women in the church. Um, now that I've grown older and interviewed some of the elderly women in the church, they never call themselves super saints. I do that. So I've noticed that over the years there are these faith spasms where, where people are really feel they're close, they're really all strong, and then they are down in the dumps, which seems to reflect the story in the scriptures of those who we even think, oh, the great people of faith. They had their ups and they had their downs. Let's be real. Or I thought, well, maybe I could do something like surrender all. You know, if that's what I, the message should be, because he surrendered his son, and we, as his children, we who want to follow him, we could say, well, surrender all. We even have a song we sing, I surrender all. I surrender all to Jesus. And that's a good thing, is it not? I should surrender all. I think that's a wonderful theme. However, in reality... In reality, that's never really as easy as it sounds, is it? I mean, it sounds really, oh, I just give everything over. But in reality, there's a struggle with it. It's, it's holding on. Bill, would you take your son and sacrifice your son? If I got the message from God and said, uh, I need to sacrifice my son, Scott, you would have me hospitalized. You would take me down. This guy has lost it. He's gone. He's a kook. Never easy. Never easy. So I was, um, I've told this story before, but I was at Walla Walla College, and I was taking one of my doctor of ministry classes. And it lasted for 10 days, so 10 days of classes, so I had to be there two weeks. And so I was there over the weekend, and and as I would go to class Monday through Friday, as I would walk from the dormitory where we were staying that summer down to the classroom, I passed there, right there on the uh, Walla Walla the, a little laundromat that was right there on the main drag. And as I was going by, I said, well, that's, that's, that's good. I, I will, uh, on Sunday, I will go wash my clothes. So Sunday came, and I packed up all my stuff on Sunday morning, and I tucked in a book 
that I had to read for my class. And so I loaded things up and I was on my way out the dorm door and heading towards the street and the parking lot and was going through the parking lot when two of my colleagues who were also taking the class said, hey, Bill, where are you going? We're going to breakfast. Why don't you go to breakfast with us? I said, well, I've already had breakfast. Thank you very much. But I'm on my way. I'm going to go down there and use the laundromat and uh, wash my clothes. And they said to me, well, um, you know, it's cheaper if you just go upstairs in the dorm. They have all the laundry facilities right there, and it's, it's cheaper than using the laundromat. And I said, oh, great. So I turned around, started heading back towards into the dorm, and they drove on their merry way. And I was just about to the door of the dormitory when I said, ah, you know, I'll go down to the laundromat. I don't mind spending an extra nickel or dime on my laundry. I'll, I'll go back down there because I knew it would be quiet down there on Sunday morning. So I went in there, not a soul in there, and so I put my stuff in and fed the machines their money and was sitting down at the far end and reading my book. Uh, about 15 minutes after I'd get there or so, uh, a woman came in with two small children. And she came in, and we did the, the normal acknowledgement. Oh, hi. No, no, we didn't speak, just kind of, mm-hmm. And uh, she started feeding the machines as well with her laundry for her kids and everything. So I'm reading, reading my book, and um, as I'm reading my book, all of a sudden something I, I read made me laugh. And I laughed out, I kind of, <laughs> kind of laughed out loud, and she goes, oh, I'm sorry, are my children disturbing you? And I said, oh, no, 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 I, just, I was just reading in my book something that made me laugh. Well, what are you reading? <laughs> I said, well, actually, I'm reading a book on liturgy. Christian liturgy. Oh, are you a pastor? I'm in my jeans, you know, and a t-shirt, kind of a printed t-shirt. And, and um, I said, well, well, yes, I am. She said, can I talk with you? Oh, yeah. Um, and she said, I came to do my laundry because today I, I'm planning on committing suicide. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, being trained, I know to say, well, had you planned how you were going to do that? Oh, yes. I'm ready to do my laundry. I'm going to take him over to the babysitter, and then I have it all planned. Oh, you're serious then about this. So I close my book, and we talk and talk and talk, and eventually I just say to her, look at, I'm just transient here. I'm going in and out of here. I'd be out of here next week, but... I know somebody you can go talk to who will help you. And so I gave, my, gave her my uh, business card out of my brief, little briefcase there, and I said, take this, go see uh, Daryl Bigger. He'll help you. He's the pastor at the church. He'll be glad to help you. He has, he's a trained psychologist. Okay. So I left. So I'm making my way back up to the dormitory, and as I'm making my way back up to the dormitory, I'm thinking about this, and all of a sudden I come to the spot where the two friends had challenged me about going back into the dorm and doing my laundry. And then it hit me. The Lord had chosen me to be in that laundromat, been working on it all week, to get me there because I would know how to help solve her problem, who to put her in touch with, which the rest of the team may not, I don't know. And he had me go, turn around when I was going to go back in and go cheaper, turn around and go back down, and even needed to find a joke in the liturgy book for me to laugh to get her attention. And I'm standing there with my laundry and my book and stuff in the parking lot, going, oh, my lands. It was so humbling and so moving I could almost not get back to the dorm. So 
So what is the lesson today, my friends? Abraham had a relationship with God. Abraham had a relationship with God. That's why he was a man of faith. It wasn't blind. It's because he had a relationship with him. The reason I was sent back down into the laundry room to go back to the laundromat was because evidently there was some type of relationship with God. He put me in that spot. And it was so humbling to me, I still think of it. How, why was I chosen of all the people to be there at that moment? You see, faith comes by seeking him. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the what? The word of God. And what are we looking for in the word of God? We're looking to find the Lord. We're looking to find the Lord. So what should you take out of here today? My suggestion to you today, and I plead with you, do not rest until you have a relationship with God. There was a man in my church, he was uh, up in Oregon, and I was first in the ministry, and he, a uh, very nice guy, he and his wife owned uh, a Christmas tree farm where they grew Christmas trees and harvested them out and sent a bunch of them down. They made their living on Christmas trees. And uh, some of the trees that didn't get harvested would get big. And so he came down and says, you know, they're too big for houses. I'll, I'll give you a Christmas tree. And I said, well, that'd be great for the church. That'd be super. And he says, yes, yes, come on up. So I went up to his farm and and walked with him. We got out. We were walking among all the little tiny ones. They were growing up. He had them all in all different stages. And so we were walking and looking for one. And, and he says, well, pick one out. And I said, no, no, you pick out which one. Because I'm not going to tell him. He's giving it. I don't want to say tick. And he says, oh, that, must, that was our prized one. But so anyway, so I, I, I let him let you pick. Let you pick. So we're walking. And as we're walking along, and I'm looking at that, and so he says, well, how about this one? I said, well, that one looks great. That will work perfect. Right height, everything. So he says, well, well, we'll bring it down to you. So I said, great. We were walking back towards his house through the, through the fields of uh, Christmas trees. And um, he turned to me and says, you know, Pastor, this is the first time in my life I've ever could say, I know God. And I, really... And I, how then? I says, well, I, the first time I, my prayers mean something. And I, I've been devoted to him all my life, but, but lately I, I know him. I know him. Now I have rarely have people say that to me. I know God. He wasn't bragging. He was just sharing what had gone in his life. I admired him for that. Thought that was wonderful. So I got the tree, and months went by, and suddenly he wasn't attending church anymore. And after he'd been missing a few weeks, because they traveled a lot, and after I'd been missing a few weeks, I went to, to find out about him, and he'd passed away. He'd had cancer. He looked normal to me, looked fine to me, but he had cancer. Took his life. The cancer helped him to find God, you see. That's... That's all because it comes down to life and death. Isn't that too bad? That he waited till he got cancer in order to say, I know God. Isn't it? Don't wait. Know God now. Make Jesus your Savior and Lord now. You can do it. Because he asks us, come and see. Come and see. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And he invites you, come and see. He told the, the apostles, well, where are you staying? Well, come and see. He's asking you, come build a relationship with me. How do you do that? You do that through his scripture. And you do that through his word. And you do that through prayer. And you do that through listening. It's not rocket science. 
come and see. That's what Abraham had. That's what we should walk out with. He had a relationship with God. So he knew how to put his trust in his Lord. Dear Father, I thank you for this incredible story of Abraham and Isaac. We can say a lot about Isaac. We can say a lot about what happened with Abraham. But Lord, what you did and what happened on that night shows us about the incredible relationship, the incredible way that that existed. Each of us need to be able to say like that man did, I know God. Abraham knew God. So did others. To listen to know when God is directing I thank you for that example. May we learn and grow and have a relationship with you. Amen.